hey, for those of you who um, tuned in to the kind of the preview meeting that we had two weeks ago, I spoke about um, this archetypal spiritual journey um, from the head to the heart. And even though it's an oversimplification, um, it feels like it's the essential, um, really the essential movement in the process of discovering who we are um, and living from that and the shift of attention, which ordinarily localizes here in the forehead, in the planning mind, to here in the heart. And <clears throat> we can have many glimpses of this along the way, but um, for me, it's like a lifelong process of deepening intimacy with this other way of knowing and being. And it's something I've been drawn to um, from a very early age. And, um, and really, as I was suggesting in the guided meditation, um, for me, it's what's most precious, actually, is living from our deepest knowing. And that would be my definition of heart wisdom. You know, it's our, our deepest knowing. So um, I, I know it's bad form to quote from yourself. <laughs> but uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and, and be, <laughs> be shameless here and quote from my book. Because <laughs> um, I like this quote. And it, it says it well that uh, our deepest knowing is interested in the truth, how things actually are. This knowing has no agenda to survive, to fit in, to be admired, or to feel better. I'll read that again. No agenda to survive, to fit in, be admired, or feel better. It's concerned with love, wisdom, integrity, and being in service to the whole or to wholeness. So there's nothing wrong with wanting to survive or fit in or be liked or um, admired <clears throat> or even to feel better. But this is not really the concern of the heart. The heart's really interested, the deep heart I'm speaking here, is really interested in true nature, what the truth is of who we are and what everything is above all. And in the uncovering or discovering of that, very often there are the byproducts actually of that we do feel better and, and function better as well in our daily life. <clears throat> but those are, those are byproducts just of aligning ourselves, of discovering and aligning ourselves with that truth. And so it's kind of an art actually to begin to sense and decode um, this other way of knowing and other way of being. Uh, it has a very different voice than the ordinary voices in our mind. <clears throat> For one, it's not judgmental. The heart wisdom has no judgments, good, bad, right, or wrong. So that's, a, that's one way of discerning, you know, um, the voice of the conditioned mind from heart wisdom is the absence of judgment. There are no shoulds or shouldn'ts in the vocabulary of the heart. And I um, will go more into this later, maybe next time. Um, but it's very interesting to just look at our thinking and notice the presence of the, of the thought should or shouldn't. And anytime that's happening, we know we're in the conditioned mind. Heart wisdom also is, doesn't assert itself. So it, it doesn't demand anything of us. <clears throat> it waits patiently, actually, for our listening. 
and, and our attunement to it. So it neither asserts nor does it deny. This is one of the beautiful teachings and orientations, pointing instructions that I learned from my teacher, Jean Klein, that our true nature neither asserts nor denies itself. It does radiate the, it has this quality of luminosity or radiance. It has a profound silence to it that's vibrant. When we're in touch with it, we feel like we're at home. We've come home. There's a sense of fullness, inherent fullness in the core of our being. And then in terms of how it moves, it, it was interesting. I, I, I had a one-on-one -on -one mentoring session with someone this week and, and he was exploring the connection between doing and being. He said, it feels like there's a gap there. And I encouraged him to, to sit with that feeling of the gap. And then he said, it's kind of like, he said, when it moves, it, it like moves like, a, like this. And he was making the movement of like a paint, he said, like a paintbrush. It just makes a stroke like that, or like a, a knife that just cuts through, or like a movement in Tai Chi. He was trying to, and, and actually succeeding beautifully, expressing some kind of spontaneous movement uh, that comes from a, a subtle inclination that we feel when we're moved by heart wisdom in our lives. And, and I'd like to call it heart wisdom. It, it actually relates to the Eastern term prajna, um, that there is this source of intelligence um, that we can sense um, through the heart it may not, it, often we do feel it in the heart, but we may not necessarily, it's not a necessity. It may be a kind of just knowing that comes to us that doesn't particularly localize anywhere, a kind of global sense of knowing that comes with a sense of being very spacious and open and grounded as well. may come not in a verbal way. Right? It could come as a surprising image, a metaphor. That's the beauty of metaphors in poetry, you know, is that it taps into this knowing and communicates it in a, in a much richer and multidimensional way. This is why the poetry of someone like Rumi is so extraordinary. Uh, it comes from that place, it arises very spontaneously. That's another quality of heart wisdom is its spontaneity. There's, there's often some quality of surprise and discovery to it as well. With heart wisdom, there's also a willingness to not know. In fact, that's kind of a prerequisite for its movement. A willingness to be no one. You know, to not have a position that needs to be defended or asserted. To be empty. to wait until something feels vibrant and authentic. That's another quality, authenticity and aliveness. So I'm using these various descriptions just to 
kind of give a sense of it, maybe from a cognitive and somatic and emotional levels. And I'm sure each of you knows at least something and perhaps quite a bit about this. So for some of you, this will be introductory and for others, this will be very familiar and hopefully validating in terms of trusting this knowing. So this is in contrast to our ordinary way of thinking, which I call the conditioned mind or the strategic mind. And strategic thinking is really about survival. <laughs> when you get to the bottom line, that's, that's the um, purpose really of the conditioned mind is to support um, the survival of the biological organism and the, the apparent separate sense itself. So it's about safety very often. And, and the mind is really designed, the conditioned mind is to recognize patterns and decode them. Very useful, you know, for <laughs> figuring out uh, how to make Zoom work, right? <laughs> right? So we need it, you know, it's a very useful tool, the conditioned mind. <clears throat> helps us, it's absolutely essential for functioning in ordinary life. The mind is able to visualize different possibilities, you know, basically create virtual realities based on past experience and imagine, you know, better ones to avoid pain, to maximize pleasure. It's really, for me, it's fascinating just to kind of watch the mind, watch one's thoughts and see what they're oriented towards. Often they're oriented towards people and relationships, trying to decode what happened, trying to you know, discern whether you're connected or disconnected. And interestingly, all of that, if you trace it backwards, social anxiety, um, if you uh, follow the thread of social anxiety back to its source, it comes to survival, interestingly. Like, am I part of the tribe or not? Or am I on my own? Am I on my own? So it's interesting to just kind of discern the difference. And it's not about in any way devaluing the mind because we absolutely need it. But it's also recognizing the limits of <clears throat> because the mind actually cannot know its source. It can know a lot of things, right? Things, objects, but it cannot know that which is not an object. And the mind will say things like, I cannot wrap my mind around this. Have you ever had that thought or heard that? Right. I can't wrap my mind around this. Exactly. Right. This meaning who we are, our true nature. Because our true nature can't be objectified, can't be quantified, can't even be qualified. So it's really important that the mind see its limits, see, recognize what it can do well and what is beyond its capacity. And when that happens, there's a, there's a kind of relaxation. There's a willingness then to not know. <clears throat> and in that willingness to not know, attention can drop down to its source into and as awareness. 
So this is part of the, a very critical part of the awakening process. It's the mind's recognition of its limits. The willingness to not know. We don't know what the next thought is going to be. I don't know what the next thought is going to be. We don't know what the next event is going to be. None of us had any idea that our lives would turn out as it has. Have any of you? <laughs> I'm completely surprised. Right? That's the truth. We don't know. And the beauty is we don't need to. The mind thinks it needs to know in or as a way of controlling right? and being safe. It's a very deep pattern. Right. So it's, it's really something for the mind to let go, to realize its limits, to recognize that there's a great deal that it doesn't know, especially its true nature. And above all, that we don't need to know. So that's like a taking the hands off of the wheel, right? And seeing that that little wheel we were holding onto actually was never connected to anything <laughs> other than our imagination. It's like a, you know, a, a, a kitty seat in the back of a car, right? We think we're steering the vehicle, right? And we're afraid to let go. <laughs> so usually what'll happen is, you know, we, we let go a little bit and we noticed actually things work just fine. Oh my God, All right? All right, so Zoom is not happening. You know, there's a glitch in the system. It's okay, you know, we start 20 minutes late. It's not a problem. <clears throat> no one's died. Maybe we're a little inconvenienced, but no, not a big deal. Do you get the feel for this? You know, this kind of the letting go, the not needing. Can you feel what happens when there's a recognition? I don't need to know. I don't know. I don't need to know. There's like a whew. Right? That's what I experience. But there's also that brings up fear, right? Of loss of control. So very often it's a process. Letting go, seeing what happens, letting that in, resuming the clutch of trying to control, releasing it again. Again, no, no judgments about it. This is entirely normal part of the process. So maybe that's enough, you know, a little bit about the heart and a little bit about the mind, the conditioned mind. Why don't we open it up to um, a conversation, a dialogue. And, and about that, what I've noticed is when there's a real, um, when there's a real vulnerability, like you really let yourself explore, a willingness to explore what's true for you and, and your deepest questions. Um, it's a beautiful gift actually for everyone. 
And so um, we'll have a chance to dialogue and also deepen in our exploration and experience. So very often I like to do a little exploration with, uh, with the, you know, whoever asks the question, maybe just five or 10 minutes, but we've got plenty of time and we've got a uh, number of weeks here to do that. But my hope is, I mean, some of you will be more, you know, willing and others more reticent to do that, but um, I promise not to bite. <laughs> um, um, and look forward to exploring, you know, what comes up for you in the way of questions and way of experience. So um, enough said. So if anyone would like to ask or share something, feel free and Kate will make that happen. <laughs> 